I want to talk to you this morning about a higher plane of life. You know, a little bit ago we had uh, a word given in our service, and I remember a, a few years ago somebody gave a word that, that began uh, with just the words, uh, I made you. Of course, you know, we believe that's the Lord speaking through us, but it said, I made you. And that, that word just kind of struck me when I heard it. And obviously, uh, it's not a new revelation. Uh, I believe, I believe God made me. And, uh, but when I heard it, I was just struck with the truth of that once again. And, um, because he made me, I have an obligation to become what he wants me to be. Uh, suppose he would have chosen not to make me, you know, what would my look like? What would my life look like if he had not created me? <laughs> Probably look a lot like it was before my birth date. Uh, there'd, have, there'd be nothing to it. But in Genesis uh, chapter 2 and verse 7, I think we're clicking here. Oh, we're not clicking. Go ahead and set that up for me, Jody. Genesis 2, 7, as well as uh, chapter 3 and verse 19. It says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Then in chapter 3, it says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So when God created man, he created him from, from dust. Um, do you realize that dust is incapable of holding its own form? Uh, and so, obviously, man then was created to be dependent upon his creator. Um, you know, the original intention was that man, by necessity, would be continually sustained by God through our fellowship with him. And therefore, all life apart from God will, by the creative design of God, fall into a formless heap. Isn't it interesting when, you know, we, we humans have adapted a, a phrase to describe how we feel about ourselves when uh, things are not going right, and, and basically we'll say things like, you know, life has just fallen apart for me. Um, when someone says, you know, my marriage is falling apart or my life is falling apart, basically what they're saying is, uh, I'm not really looking to God the way I should. Uh, because without God, everything falls apart. Isn't that right? <clears throat> our lives are dust. Our marriages are dust. Our children are dust. Even our jobs are, are merely dust. Unless we have right fellowship with God. God then becomes that which maintains life for us. Um, you know, years ago there was a, a rock group called Kansas. I forget what state they're from, but uh, they're known for a song that they wrote called Dust in the Wind, and it's a song that has no hope. You know, it really is quite common, you know, for men who don't know God to have this perspective on life, because without Christ, we are just dust in the wind without any real purpose, and I'm, I Wrote down the, the words to the, the last chorus of that song. So if any of you know it, you can sing it. But I'm just going to read it. It says, now don't hang on. Nothing lasts forever but the earth and the sky. It slips away. And all your money won't um, another minute buy dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. Everything is dust in the wind. That was originally written by Dusty Springfield, I think. I'm not sure. But the Bible says that we've been made out of dust and that we return to dust. So in one sense, the composer of this song was, was correct. Everybody knows that when composers go to the grave, they no longer compose, they decompose and uh, eventually become dust. So he's a little prophetic. 
But interesting enough, one of the members of that band got saved now and is writing and singing for Jesus. And, and I would imagine he has a whole new perspective on that song, don't you think? There's a rather well-known fictitious account of some scientists who were quite proud of their accomplishments so much so that they decided that they would challenge God and they got a hold of him and said, God, we have gained so much knowledge that we believe we can do anything that you can do. And so we want to challenge you to a contest to see who can make uh, the best human being out of dust. And God said, okay. So the scientists reached down to the ground to get a handful of dirt. And God said, hold on there. That's my dirt. You go get your own dirt if you're going to compete with me. <clears throat> but you know, everything man does, everything man creates comes from the dust of the earth. Every facet of this building, you know, the fuel we put in our cars, the food we eat, literally everything comes from the earth, even man himself. And in Genesis 1, 3, 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Man may be able to use his ingenuity and his creativity to work with what he has, but everything he has comes from God, and it's sustained by God's word. Only God can create heaven and earth with just his words. Uh, only God can say, let there be light, and find that it's there. Only God can make a man out of nothing. You know, man may try to clone another human being, but even then, it's not making something out of nothing. Uh, even cloning is dependent upon what, what God has already created. <clears throat> God breathed life into Adam, and as a result of that, a living soul was birthed, which had personality and had expression. You know, the word life there is, is plural. Uh, God's original intent for man is to live on two levels of expression. We have an earthly existence, and we have a spiritual existence. And the breath that God breathed into Adam was the sustaining power to maintain him on each of these levels. But through disobedience, man lost that higher form of life. You know, we often say, well, Adam fell. Well, really, Satan fell from heaven. Man died when he sinned, spiritually. But through education, refinement, and sometimes religion, uh, society is trying to pick man up and, and reconstruct him. But, but man really is dead without God. Without God, all we are is dust in the wind. Even if man is successful in cloning another human being, it'll be nothing more than a living dead man because man will never be able to create the life of God within another human being. So maybe these living dead men is where the zombie apocalypse is going to come from someday. But the death that Adam and Eve suffered was spiritual. They were separated from God. And thus, their death separated them from the highest state of life that God wants for man and brought them to this lower plane of life. The lower state of life is a, a temporal life, you know, just pertaining to the earthly realm. As an earthly being, we have faculties that, that enable us to, to function within our environment. And through the use of these, we either prosper or we suffer in various degrees. In fact, prospering or suffering is typically how we measure the quality of our earthly life. But there is also a higher state of life that is available to us. And through the new birth, we are enabled to live on a higher plane. Along with the new birth, we have been provided uh, with faculties or, or abilities to relate 
to our newly recreated spiritual life. And that's why I believe at the heart of, uh, that, that is what I believe was at the heart of everything Jesus did on earth. He tried to get us to see that there's a higher state of living available to all of us. In Mark 11, we see Jesus in uh, what's called the triumphal entry. But following his triumphal entry, he goes immediately into the temple. And in verse 11, it says, He entered Jerusalem, came into the temple, and after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. Now, I thought that verse was interesting. You know, he, he uh, goes into the temple and he looks around. Just kind of gazes around at things, so it seems. Um, I looked at several commentators on this verse, and, and none of them have any, any significant thoughts concerning this. I wonder if it just simply re refers to the, maybe the shepherd heart that Jesus had. Uh, Jesus knew his days were numbered, and yet he, he shows an interest in how things were in the temple. Uh, the temple is you know, symbolic, really, of, of the man's heart. Uh, and so to refer to one is to refer to the other. And this whole thing comes back to the fact that God made us. And subsequently, he's very interested in which level of life we are living at. You know, what is ministry except an introduction to a whole new level of life? You who are actively involved in ministry either within the, the context of prayer house or not, because there are many of you doing ministry outside of our church, and that's excellent. It's, it's, it's what we're supposed to do. But my point is, when Jesus introduced you to your ministry, he also introduced you to a whole new level of living. Many years ago, I preached the message called Others May, but You May Not. It was a, it was a term we had to use on Ronnie all the time. Uh, you know, but it was basically, it was, you know, trying to, trying to get into his head that what a lot of other people may do, you may not do because there's something about Christ in you that doesn't allow you to do just what everyone else does. Um, it's all about the demands uh, of ministry. Uh, that's, you know, there, there are demands on the lives of those that God has purpose for. And actually, God has purpose for every one of us. We all respond differently to the Lord, but he has purpose for every one of us. And with that purpose comes certain demands as to how we live. There may be many things others do, and even do it in the sight of God without any issues. It's not a matter of it being sinful. There may be many things others do that you may not do just because of the calling of God on your life. You have a higher plane of life to live on. You know, in Revelation 3, <clears throat> 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. And that, that doorway speaks of uh, a point of transition from the temporal into the spiritual realm. You know, the church in Laodicea was living very much in the temporal realm at that point. They said of themselves, you know, we are rich, we have need of nothing. In other words, all they saw was, was this earthly life. But do you see how superficial that is to think that uh, this is all that life really is all about? Jesus comes to that carnal church to help them come into a higher plane of living. If they'll simply open up to him and allow him to come in with to them and sup with them and he with me. You know, the, the act of supping is that of divine fellowship. Uh, it's really, it's the prayer life. So through the new birth and the indwelling Holy Spirit, all that is beyond that door is accessible to us. You know, some people have said, well, the Laodicean church, they probably weren't even saved. That's why Jesus was on the outside knocking to get in but the very fact that this church is within the the kingdom of god and one of the churches of the seven churches of asia uh, makes us believe that they are a new testament church it's just that at that point they were a very carnal church 
very much taken up with themselves rather than Jesus. <clears throat> and what I see that example teaching us is that we can be saved and yet live very near that door, simply satisfied with the gift of salvation, taken up merely with carnal comforts. And, and, or, we, or we can choose to go further into that realm of intimate communion and cooperation with our Lord. You know, Hebrews 6, 1 says, Therefore let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Don't misunderstand. Jesus does meet all our needs, even our carnal needs. He provides us with food and shelter and jobs. But that is that all that the Christian existence is meant to be? I mean, if that's it, there are a lot of ungodly people that live way better than us if you're just talking this world. Isn't that right? Is that all there is to being born again? The writer goes on of Hebrews goes on to say, you know, we should move beyond these elementary principles of, of Christ, meaning salvation, and go into laying on of hands and resurrecting the dead and eternal judgment. He said, those, those are the, you know, we need to move beyond just being saved into the works of God. <clears throat> when Jesus walks through the temple to look around, do you suppose his only concern was whether the temple was clean or not? Uh, how how in order were all the religious symbols? I doubt if that was his primary concern. But it might have been part of his concern. I mean, I can't think of how many times I've come home from uh, doing a conference or something, and I'll come to the, the building sometimes at night to pray and, and uh, just look things over to, to see if it's clean. <laughs> My wife can't figure out what I'm looking at because she doesn't think I can see dirt. But uh, I can see it when it's obvious. I mean, I'm aware there's dirt everywhere. <laughs> Our grass is planted in it. You know, we got dirt. But I remember when this facility was brand new and, and we had just planted the lawn and, and for quite some time was not very happy with it for various reasons because it mostly looked like it was full of weeds as it was growing. But... Is more than just wanting a nice lawn. It is wanting to make a right impression on those who are looking at the church from a carnal perspective because sometimes that which starts in the flesh can end in the spirit. But I believe the greater concern of Christ is whether or not the temple was there, was able to help people spiritually. Sometimes the physical needs to be cared for in order for others to be ministered to spiritually. And I want to thank the Lord for those who volunteer and clean in our church as one ministry. You know, that means a lot to Pastor Ronnie and I. Uh, Bertha is heading that up and, and doing just a great job, and there's a whole bunch of you involved in that. And that's not a small task, and it's not an insignificant task. So Jesus leaves the temple, and he goes to Bethany. And this is a perfect example now of how the spiritual and physical blend together. He comes up to a fig tree because he's hungry. And that seems to refer to his, his physical need. It could refer to his spiritual need too, but in this sense he is looking for a fig for sustenance. And he finds this tree with no fruit on it at all. Its, its physical condition was such that it could not bear fruit. And subsequently, he curses that tree and it withers. Well, that, you know, the fig tree is symbolic of the Christian. When Jesus comes to us hoping that we will bear something that he could use to minister to someone else, what does he find? Does he find your life bearing the kind of fruit that's valuable in the kingdom of God? When we are confronted with temptation? Does our life bear the fruit of self-control? When we are confronted with ignorance, are we able to bear long-suffering? When Doug and Kim and Deanna and Laura work their ministry uh, and, the, and the others involved, don't you think that the fruit of the Spirit becomes the essence of that ministry? 
If they're not able to produce love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, what do they have to offer those they're trying to minister to? Many years ago when Bill Gray, missionaries that we support in, in Mobile, was in our church, he was, he was talking about uh, one day when he was out on the street uh, sharing the gospel in the, in the uh, slums down there in Mobile. He said a guy came and shoved a beer can in his face and said, this is my God. You know, most of us would probably have walked away from that and saying, I want nothing to do with that because we're not bearing the kind of fruit that Jesus could use in those kind of situations. Just try to do the work of God by standing so close to the door of salvation that you never really grow in his character. Our existence is not meant to be strictly carnal. God has purpose and direction for every one of us. But we must move ourselves to this higher plane of life, to this spiritual plane of life. I remember reading a book years ago, and the author made a, an interesting statement. He said, we become the decisions we make. So just think about that. Your life is defined by the decisions you make. Whatever it is you're known as, that means those are the decisions you have made. God made us. We have an obligation to be what he wants us to be. However, because of the free will of man, we don't always turn out exactly the way God wants us to be. We become the decisions we make. God wants us holy. But if we decide to immerse ourselves in immoral behavior, we become immoral people instead of holy people. God wants us joyful. But if we choose not to forgive someone, we become bitter. It's the opposite of what Jesus has for you because you're living on a lower plane than what he has for you. And if we do not bear the proper fruit, then we become almost useless in the kingdom of God. That fig tree offered nothing that Jesus could use. So here's the problem. We can't develop into all that God wants us to be by clinging to the fact that we are saved only. If that's your only issue, well, I'm saved. <clears throat> You're not going to develop into all that God wants you to be. So after having gone to Bethany, Jesus returns to Jerusalem, and he goes back to the temple. And uh, perhaps this, you know, the, perhaps the first time when Jesus looked around the temple, he saw all the things, maybe things that displease him. I don't know. That's all conjecture. But this time he walks in and he starts casting out those who are corrupting the temple. And he makes his famous statement, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And in so making that, he's, he's setting prayer up as the preeminent thing in the house of God. That if, if the house of God is not a house of prayer, then it becomes a place that robs God. You know, the temple of, of the Lord our hearts are supposed to be a house of prayer, not merely just a carnal place. Prayer is what moves us away from the beginning stages of our Christianity into a higher plane of life. The prayer life is the separation we need from all the security blankets that we hang on to. You know, security blankets are basically carnal things that we, we're afraid to let go of because to let go of that security blanket means, what am I going to hang on to? Well, you hang on to God. It's letting go of those things which then develops a dependency upon the Lord. And without the Lord, dust cannot maintain its shape. Just think of how many times you've heard someone say that, you know, the Lord really wanted me to do something, but I, I just couldn't do it until I began to pray about it. And after I prayed and prayed and prayed, finally, I let the Lord lead me into what he wanted. You know, prayer is what takes us from the immature position of clinging to the elementary teachings about Christ into the higher plane of living called serving God. Prayer is what opens that door to fellowship with the Lord at, at a level that we never had before. Uh, just just think of what ministry is. You know, ministry 
has been called the fruit of discipline. Whenever we discipline ourselves in something, that discipline bears fruit. That fruit, then, is what God uses in your life to speak to the needs of those around you. So if we're talking, in this case, about the discipline of prayer, prayer is what develops the fruit of the Spirit in us. You can study the fruit of the Spirit. You can memorize them. You can hang plaques of them in your home. But they don't develop that way. They don't develop just through studying them. They're the fruit of the Spirit of God. They're, they're what bears in your life from having spent time in the presence of God. Without that time in His presence, we just don't become like Jesus at all. So that many times, that, you know, that's why the Proverbs says that you spend time with a wise man, you become wise. You spend time with a, a, a fool, you become foolish. Because the spirit of those we spend time with is what begins to develop in us. That's why so many times when I bring friends over to my house in junior high after school and we'd hang out or something when they left, many times my mom, my mom said, never bring that kid back in the house. <laughs> I said, why, Mom? Because she knew, as parents know, she knew the spirit of that kid was going to develop in me if I kept hanging out with him. And he wasn't nearly as nice as I was. She wanted to keep me nice. So fruit is what comes out of time in God's presence. Jesus once said, you know, learn from me. I am gentle and I am humble in heart. Jesus is gentle. Gentleness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Suppose a person spent so much time in the presence of God that his life became marked by gentleness. And with time, gentleness will be his ministry. God will use his character to minister to the needs of those around him. So when Jesus drops by to take a look at your temple, your heart, what does he find? What, what is your life bearing? What does he find there that brings glory to him? Or does he find things he would rather cast out? What does he find? What level of life are you living on? 